The thought of tearing in childbirth can feel a real cringy. I get it. Research shows that up to 75% of people experience a tear during childbirth. But did you know that not all tears require stitches? It's the more severe tears that are a concern and can lead to complications later in life. In this video, I teach you five ways to avoid tearing in childbirth, which can also lead to an easier pushing experience. If you're new here, hi, I'm Kelly. And on this channel, I teach you how to have an unmedicated hospital-based birth and how to feel ready and empowered for your birth. Let's get started. One of the most common fears that I hear from my clients is that they are afraid of tearing in childbirth. Go ahead and press the like button if you agree that one of your top fears in childbirth is tearing. So how often do people tear? Well, the research shows that anywhere between 50 to 75% of people tear during a vaginal birth. A first and second degree tear is considered a minimal tear, but when you move into the third and fourth degree tears, that's what we call a severe tear. A severe tear is those third and fourth degree tears, and anywhere between three to 7% of people fall into that category. One of the reasons why you want to avoid a tear in childbirth is that it can lead to some complications, both immediately after birth in that postpartum period and possibly well into the remainder of your life. Initially, a tear can cause pain or discomfort in the postpartum with or without stitches, some tenderness, uh, swelling, and tightness. It's challenging to have this kind of pain in addition to recovering from childbirth and taking care of a newborn baby, getting your milk supply in, breastfeeding your baby, can be really challenging to add another layer of recovery needed during your postpartum. Another reason why avoiding tears is ideal is because tears can lead to problems later in your postpartum or in your life, such as painful sex and incontinence. And so what can we do during childbirth that can help minimize the chance of a tear and definitely minimize the chance of a severe tear? Tip number one, laboring down. Did you know that during physiologic birth, after transition, which is the final steps to dilating your cervix to a 10, there's typically a period of time where contractions slow down in frequency and intensity before the urge to pish comes. Laboring down is simply waiting to push until there is an urge or reason to push beyond just that your cervix is at 10 centimeters. Did you know that your body's contractions will naturally bring your baby lower? You can save valuable energy and possibly even time by just allowing a little break between the finish of dilation and beginning the pushing process. Number two, push in an upright position. All evidence shows that when we utilize gravity during the pushing stage, it often leads to better pushing outcomes for mom and for baby and less tearing. And so upright positions could look like um, squatting or on all fours. Now, a common question that I get is, what if I have an epidural? Am I required to push on my back if I have an epidural? Well, that question needs to be asked your medical provider because every provider has a different stance on this exact topic. Just because you have an epidural doesn't mean that you aren't able to use your legs at all. As a doula, I've supported many clients who have gotten an epidural and are still able with support to get up on hands and knees to push their baby out. But not all medical providers like this, and some may want or even require you to lay on your back with your feet in stirrups for pushing. That position is linked to more severe tears. I wanna show you this picture right over here of my client who had an epidural and was able to push her baby out in this position. I love this photo because it shows how we can 
maneuver the hospital bed to actually um, bring a squat bar out. And so mom can hold on to the squat bar and use gravity to push her baby out. Now this position worked because her epidural had worn off some and she still had some uh, control over her legs. And also because her provider was comfortable with her pushing in this position. Tip number three, spontaneous pushing. What this means is that you are directing pushing yourself rather than being coached by your nurse or your doctor through the pushing process. And so there's two different ways this can look, the pushing process can look. The way that we see most depicted in the media or in movies is the nurse or doctor telling you exactly when to push, hold your breath, how long to push, and how often to push. This is coached pushing. The other option is spontaneous pushing, maybe also known as self-directed pushing, intuitive pushing, or just breathing your baby out. This is a method of pushing where you are more in tune with the sensations of your body and pushing as you feel the urge to do so without the input of other people. And depending on the skill set of your provider or maybe even your own personality and what works for you, intuitive pushing is correlated with less tearing because in this case where the birthing person is able to connect with their body, there's more of a natural rhythm of when to push and when to hold back rather than just blasting your baby out, which can often lead to more severe tears. Tip number four, don't hold your breath. Far too often am I seeing in the labor and delivery room, nurses and doctors telling their patients to hold their breath during pushing. Ask any pelvic floor physical therapist and they would agree that Holding your breath during pushing is uh, linked to more trauma in the pelvic floor region and more tears. Bearing down kind of sensation oftentimes invites extra tension into the pelvic floor. And when the pelvic floor is tense, it's more likely to tear. So whenever possible, breathing during your contractions, breathing during pushing, and trusting that your body is perfectly designed to get your baby down and out. And using the breath can increase oxygen to your baby, it can reduce tearing, and it helps you feel more connected to your birth process. And tip number five, which honestly is one of the biggest predictors of if you will tear or not, is knowing and trusting your provider. Every provider has a different level of training, experience, and even just perspective on how pushing should look. Some questions to ask your provider are, are you, do you use a hands-on or a hands-off approach when it comes to pushing? And if your provider uses a hands-on approach, maybe asking some questions about their episiotomy rates or how often they witness severe tears. You could ask your provider if they provide perennial support or warm compresses, and if they have any time limits for you on how long you'd be allowed to push without the introduction of an intervention, such as the vacuum or forceps or Pitocin. All of these questions are super important to ask your provider far in advance of your third trimester. Making sure that you have a provider who is a good fit for your vision of how you want to push your baby down and out is essential. Your provider's technique and philosophy will determine how likely it is that you tear during childbirth. Following these five methods to avoid tearing during childbirth not only help reduce the likelihood of tears and severe tears, but also can make the pushing process easier. It doesn't have to look like you've seen it in the movies. Pushing can be quiet. It can be peaceful. It can be an inward private experience. It also doesn't have to be that way. 
The point is I want you to feel empowered to have a vision for what your pushing experience looks like and communicate that ahead of time with your provider to make sure you're a good fit with that medical provider. If you need some inspiration and want to hear a positive hospital birth story, I recorded the story of my firstborn. I had a super positive hospital-based experience. After that, go ahead and binge watch my series, Better Hospital Birth. I talked to you all about how to have an unmedicated hospital birth, if that's what you want, and how to avoid labor inductions, and when to know if a labor induction is medically necessary or is more elective. Get educated and empowered on your birth because you matter and your birth matters too.